I'm Vincent. Uh, I'm currently an engineer at GoFundMe. I've been working in payments for a while now, e-commerce since the late 1900s, and crowdfunding since about 2012. Uh, so we're going to learn a little bit about payments today, a little bit about engineering, and we might just learn a little bit about ourselves along the way. <laughs> um, oh, my clicker. I'll just do it this way. Uh, so overview, we'll talk about what's payments engineering, explore payments and payment systems using credit cards as an example, uh, and then bring that back to engineering and talk about the types of problems we deal with there. And then Q&A at the end. Uh, but again, if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. So firstly, what is payments engineering? Um, it's made up like software engineer. Sounds cool. Uh, so it's just building software in the domain of payments. So <laughs> um, a, a, a list of things that that could mean, and this applies more broadly to other industries as well, where you have to worry about things like um, precision and fault tolerance, security and privacy, um, expensive mistakes. Um, so if this doesn't sound interesting to you, I'm very sorry for tricking you to coming into my talk, but there are some fun gifts later. Uh, so firstly, what's a payment? We have a, a formal definition here from Glenbrook Partners' uh, book, Payment Systems in the US. Uh, transfer of value between a sender and receiver denominated in some currency. So US dollars, for example, the currency is important there. Uh, sender to receiver, so here is a um, uh, coffee customer paying for their drink with some USD cash. So the act of handing that cash over to the barista is a payment. The coffee they get in return is uh, tangential. Uh, so what's a payment system? It's probably something that facilitates payments, but again, we have a formal definition here. Uh, it connects senders and receivers and provides a framework for transferring value. So examples, credit cards, which we'll go into, bank transfers, cash, digital currencies, Dogecoin, Bitcoin, uh, and this is an example of a Rube Goldberg machine, because there's a lot of overcomplicatedness and indirection. <laughs> So credit cards, uh, it's a pretty old idea, um, but you'll see uh, there's a line to how we use credit cards today. It's pretty unchanged. You could take it all the way back to you know Mesopotamia and clay tablets. The idea of uh, you know value out outside of like something tangible good. Uh, it's a little outside the scope of this talk. Uh, but if we go back to the credit cards of like the 1950s, 1960s, it's pretty close to what we have today as a payment system. Uh, so like these states that a, a credit card payment goes through are like pretty similar to what we had many decades ago, and we'll, we'll go into these in detail. Uh, so what it, what, how does this system work? Uh, again, the payment system connects sender and receiver, transfer value. So here the sender would be the card holder. The merchant would be the receiver. The card networks do this by issuing a credit card. So that comes from an issuing bank. I bank with Chase, for example. I have a Chase credit card. Debit cards work in a similar way. Um, and then the merchant, so I go to Target and buy my goodies. They're working with an acquiring bank, maybe Wells Fargo. And the card networks are there in the middle to help facilitate the transfer of value, the money from the issuing bank to the acquiring bank. It's very high level. We'll get into the the nitty gritty. Any questions so far? All right, the first step in this flow is authorization. So again, this is uh, an older idea. This would have been around in the 50s or 60s and would have started out as a phone call. So I walk into an old timey shop like Montgomery Ward to buy my mining equipment or what everyone does in the olden times and they'll make a phone call and say, hey, does, does Vincent have the you know, $5 to cover this, this pickaxe and, and boots uh, with account number 123, and they'll get a yes or a no. Uh, today, same, same thing, but it's computer to computer, and this would include things like a pin check, things like that, and, you know, uh, authorizing a certain amount, um, given certain details, and they'll get back a yes or a no. Assuming this passes, um, the money hasn't transferred yet, so there's a reason you might 
linger in the authorization phase. Uh, one example is fraud detection, so I'm touching on it broadly, um, where uh, before a transaction is fully captured, which we'll, we'll get to, which means the money is actually set aside, uh, I might go through some fraud review. Uh, another example you might have encountered, you go to a hotel, and even though maybe you already paid for the room, for example, they'll have you swipe your card, you're going to put a hold on your card to make sure you don't run up a big minibar uh, tab. Um, so that's it's kind of like a hold, and at the end they can capture up to the authorized amount or it'll just fall off and um, get voided. So if you ever have like a pending transaction on your credit card statement, that's this authorization phase. Uh, same thing at the gas pump, right? You're, it, it's kind of hanging out in that authorization phase. It doesn't know how much gas you're going to pump. Um, so it pre-authorizes a certain amount, and then we'll capture uh, the correct amount at the end. So assuming that all went fine, you end up in the capture phase. So again, this is a, an older idea. In, in olden times, this would have been the act of collecting the paper records uh, and taking them to the acquiring bank to get paid. No money has transferred quite yet. There's uh, something between capture and settle. Um, that's actually the movement of funds from uh, acquiring bank to uh, issuing bank to acquiring bank. If that all happens, this is the end of the happy path. A very happy cat here. Um, they've facilitated the transfer value from sender to receiver, and and all is well. So it is very broadly how credit cards work. Uh, we only went over the happy path though. So there are these these red nodes to talk about. Um, like most of these are I I expected, like you as a developer, if you're in between these things, you'll expect that not every card swipe is going to be successful, right? So that'll fail for a number of reasons. Um, you know, point of sale, maybe it's insufficient funds online. It could be any number of things, like could be a bad credit card number, bad expiration. Uh, there's all kinds of codes, some of which are recoverable, some of them aren't. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure, like if you're in the middle here, uh, for example, I, you know, you make a payment on some shop, you're going to want to know the error coming back. That's something you can fix, right? But you also don't want to tip off too much to fraudsters. Um, what's really interesting here, though, is the, uh, the last two refunded and charged back. So you, in, in these cases, you can go all the way to settled. The money has now moved from sender to receiver, and it's getting reversed. So this, this, is, this is a gotcha you got to think about. Refunds are uh, initiated by the, the merchant, right? So I ask for a refund from the merchant, right? Um, return an item, for example. Chargebacks happen outside of that relationship. So that's you, you know, for example, uh, maybe you lost your credit card and you go, oh, hey, fraudulent charges, charge it back. Um, or uh, there's also something called friendly fraud where you know you made the purchase, but you're going to tell your credit card company you didn't. Um, so yeah, th that's the, that's a gotcha, um, where, uh, there's no like terminal happy path, uh, because you have to worry about refunds and chargebacks many months after the, the transaction settled. So, um, a lot of times we measure our success for fraud detection by our chargeback rate, but as you mentioned, it can take months for us to get the yeah. actual chargeback data. So. Uh, is there an alternative that you would uh, like also choose to use to measure fraud success or payment success? Oh man, that's a good one. So uh, it's a really lagging indicator, right? If you get all the way to chargebacks, right? And it's very expensive too because chargebacks not only reverse the funds and you eat whatever transaction costs, right? Credit card companies don't make, just make money from, uh, you know, interest. They make the money from, uh, uh, interchange. So every time you swipe your card, the merchant pays something there. So you lose that, and then you also lose uh, money on a penalty. So usually chargebacks are like $15 per chargeback, right? So uh, using that as an indicator for success, yeah, is expensive and, and, and laggy. Uh, I don't have like the, the answer other than, uh, you know, you, you, want, you want to get in maybe the pre-capture phase, right? And it's tough to know like how much good traffic you're, you're stopping there, but so yeah. The second half of my question then is for those uh, instances where there is a soft hold put on the card, 
but then when they go to capture the funds, they're not available. Was that, would that fall into the canceled ba bad path? Yeah, I think if it's not yet captured, I think we'd call that canceled. Yeah, I mean, this isn't an exhaustive um, uh, state diagram either. Like, there'd be other, like, failure states between authorized and capture you'd have to worry about. Good question. So you work in, you work in payments and fraud? Nice, nice. Okay, so that was, a, that was a broad overview of payments using credit cards as an example. Now let's bring it back to engineering. Um, this is Hecker. If you have kids, you probably know who Hecker is. He's an engineer. <laughs> um, so back to this, this state diagram. You look at this and you go, okay, well, how do I model this in my software? Um, in my earlier e-commerce days, my mental model of this was pretty much just uh, green or red. Right, so you're, you're paying for something, and either that payment was successful or not. Uh, when you get in the middle of this thing, right, and you have like you're, you're servicing many merchants, you have to worry <laughs> about all these state changes. And so one example of this would be reconciliation and auditing, right? So in my early e-commerce days, I would just, well, that's an accounting problem. I don't really need to worry about that. Um, but if you're servicing many merchants, you do have to answer this type of question. So uh, and a, a naive implementation would be to have something like a, a payment uh, entity in your in your system, and as the as it goes through different states, you're going to update that, right, and say status equals settled, status equals refunded, status equals chargeback. The problem happens. Uh, so let's say you know I have a na naive query select star where date e is inside February and status equals settled, and I'll get back something like this. Uh, but then I, I'd miss out on these, these here, right? The refunds and the chargebacks. And the problem is, <laughs> they might have been settled in in one month and refunded or charged back in another month. So you can't really just look at this thing um, in its current state. You need to you need to understand where it's been, right? So the uh, things happen in a point in time and record facts. This is the this is the lesson to learn. So that way, here, you can just say, uh, so long as there's a, a distinct record or a way to pull the, the distinct state by the date, now you can you know, get this tally of uh, not just transaction amounts, but negative amounts when the, the flow of funds reverses. So chargebacks and refunds should be negative line items. The bigger idea here is immutable architecture. All right, so this isn't unique to payments, although you will see it in traditional ledgers, right? Like paper ledgers, Blockchain ledgers, same idea. Um, get is an example of immutable architecture. The changes you make to your code are actually diffs and patches applied um, one after the next. So unless you do some crazy rebasing, um, get is immutable. Kafka is another example. Um, of, uh, it's an uh, append-only log for event streaming. So these are a few other examples of immutable architecture in the world. Does anybody have a, a, another example? of immutable architecture. Okay, so I'll pander to the, the Nix folks. <laughs> I just learned this. Nix's whole thing is, uh, you know, immutable. Um, it's an immutable design where the, uh, uh, rather than like updating packages, it applies it in a reproducible way. So shout out to Z for uh, indoctrinating me on Nix yesterday. Okay, so that was uh, modeling payment state and uh, immutability being an important design choice. Um, any questions on that before we move to a different problem? All right, so here's something you might have experienced. It's a little less common now, but you know, maybe DMV website, for example, um, might be a little outdated. So you go to make a payment and it says, hey, don't refresh, don't click twice, because you'll get charged multiple times. Um, anybody experience this? Yeah, so, <laughs> it's a couple days ago, yeah. Oh my God, yeah, that is, that, is, that is embarrassing, right? Because, you know, it seems like a simple solution is just like, okay, well, you front-end developer, just make sure that button is disabled, you shouldn't be putting that burden on the, the user of your system. So that's one example. We're like, okay, I'm making multiple requests. It's going to be multiple payments. There's another one that's a little more insidious and difficult to think about, which is 
Um, you make a payment and then on the back end it times out, right? Uh, something went wrong, right? Like maybe the, the back end doesn't even know enough to tell you what happened. So maybe you'll encourage your users to try again, but maybe that means they get charged another time. Um, this is kind of a fundamental problem in distributed computing, and this is all distributed computing now in 2024. Um, so there's this list of the fallacies of distributed computing came out in 96-ish. Um, one of the fallacies is the network is reliable, so the corollary to that is the network is unreliable. This is a, a fact of life we have to deal with, is that some amount of transactions are going to end up in this unknown state. Right, so even if you're working with a PSP with five nines or something, that's just going to, you know, one in 10,000 requests might end up in this state. Realistically, it's probably going to be more like one in 1,000, uh, and that adds up, especially if you're <laughs> responsible for, uh, you know, connecting the merchants and the customers. Uh, so how do, we, how do we deal with this unknown? And th this is a, a depiction of the Byzantine generals problem, which is more of a consensus issue, uh, but it's a similar idea, right? Like if you, you don't know, this is the Byzantine generals problems where, you know, two sides need to coordinate, say send messages, uh, messengers to each other that might get uh, killed along the way, and how do you know whether or not your message was received? The answer is you, you, there's no perfect solution there. So the, the pragmatic solution is item potency, safe retries. It's an old idea, it comes from math, uh, but there was a draft um, proposal in 2005 called Post Once Exactly. I think they were trying to make this part of a HTTP spec because this is a common problem. Um, it was not accepted, but arguably influenced item potency keys used in Stripe and AWS. So not just a payments thing, uh, but very, very helpful in payments. So this is an example of uh, this is from, from AWS. So the idea is, hey, I spin up a bunch of expensive cloud compute. I get like a, a timeout. Do I try that again? And now I'll get charged God knows what for my, my EC2s. So um, safe retries are helpful even outside of payments. So you have to create this thing called an item potency key, and it's just a unique, unique value. It's generally scoped to you as the client, so you don't have to worry about colliding with other folks, but you do need to worry about collisions from your own system. So you might want to hash some stuff together. This is a, a, a SHA-256 of a user ID, an order ID, and amount. And so the idea here is uh, any request with the same item potency key is always going to yield this, the initial result. It's not going to redo it. Uh, the other thing you do is just like use the UUID, but you need to know when to regenerate one, right? So imagine um, you're on a checkout page. You've, you've got your your order summary, your, you click the, the payment button, and you end up in this uns uh, the, the safe retry thing, great. What you wouldn't want to happen is if you then, uh, after an error, change something in the form and use the same item potency key, it's going to pretend like it's the old request. So be careful here. I would recommend hashing. Uh, and so here's an example from Stripe. Given an item potency key, um, you can make this request a thousand times, it will never, never yield anything but the initial result. Um, and again, you might not have gotten that initial result, uh, but the idea is safe retries. So assuming you got your item potency keys correct, you can click to your heart's content. Um, a little side story here of kind of item potent design in, in real life. I had a, an old uh, 96 Civic, love that car, it had an aftermarket uh, alarm with one button. So this one button would both lock and unlock the car, and there was no like audible feedback, right? So I go to lock my car, press the button, and now I'm not sure. Well, one did the did it connect? I gotta like listen for the latches, uh, or maybe I forgot if I hit the button. So now I end up in this like prisoner's dilemma <laughs> in my own mind of like, do I press the button again? Because if it went through the first time, the second time is gonna unlock it. Uh, so in this case, the unreliable network is my own brain, uh, but there's a solution, right? So like the, this right here, you got a, a yes and a no. Like it's pretty pretty simple idea. If you have an on button, you can only turn something on once, and then likewise with off. So you can see uh, examples in everyday life of where this design choice is helpful. I guess think of a power switch versus a power button. Can't go beyond that initial state. Thoughts or questions here? 
Any, anybody else have uh, examples of idempotency they want to talk about? I've got these journals here. <laughs> All right. So uh, that was kind of the fun stuff. So now we'll get back to some fundamentals. This is quite broad, but um, v important for payments. So we talked about expensive mistakes. Um, you know, uh, you're dealing with uh, kind of high emotional states sometimes when somebody's trying to like get or send money. Uh, so it's you really don't want to mess up. But we are all fallible humans. So the idea is to have systems to catch these things. Um, one concept is you know uh, called failing fast. So I like compiled languages for this reason, right? You have as much um, upfront to prevent uh, things going wrong in production. So even if you're not using a compiled language, though, um, unit tests, integration tests, uh, UI and end tests, this is the testing pyramid. Um, you might have seen it elsewhere. Some pyramids are broken into five, six, seven layers. Um, you know, where, where you want to draw that line is a little less important than the, just the idea of having a few different levels of tests. So we'll start with unit tests. What's a unit test, right? There's going to have very different opinions on this. Um, but compared to other things, it should be the fastest type of test. You're testing a component in isolation. So you should be able to run a unit test suite in seconds, you know, ideally. And this is important because you want to be able to um, you know, make a change, add a test, run the test. You know, that, that whole life cycle should be painless. If this takes a long time to run, people aren't going to maintain it. Um, you could do this through mocks and stubs, right? So you're testing like a, a single layer of your application, and you mock all the dependencies. So this could be things, it's usually, this is usually domain logic, right? So you're like, get, get the, um, the shipping rate for the zip code or something. Like, you want to make sure that it's calling the right things. But this isn't quite end to end yet. Integration tests, again, kind of a murky term, but compared to unit tests, they're going to be slower. Um, but they should still be fast enough that you can run the suite in you know, low minutes. Uh, and here you're going to be integrating multiple components, multiple classes, and possibly use real infrastructure. So maybe you're spinning up a real database, for example. Uh, but again, these should be quick. UI end to end. So if you have a UI, that should be instrumented. Uh, this used to be a uh, very specialized thing, right? So you have uh, test engineers writing stuff with Selenium. Now it's very accessible. There's frameworks like Cypress. So if you can write a front end, you can write a front end automation. Uh, this is going to be slow, though, and often fragile, because it's going to be subject to changes in the UI. But it's invaluable if you compare it to uh, either you manually going through every flow, or you not doing that, and then your users are now testing your software. Uh, so again, our, our goal here is to uh, fail fast. So let's uh, worry about failing tests before um, you know, the late alarm system is like folks writing into customer service. So that's, that's not where you want to be. Uh, here, you'd make real calls against staging environments. So in payments, you know, you'd, be, you'd be making calls against staging environments. Hopefully, those exist for whoever you're integrating with. And you'd go through the entire flow, right? So go from like adding something to your cart to making the payment to getting to the receipt page, for example. Uh, and this is, this is actually the final slide before Q&A. Um, logging and monitoring, I should have broken this up a little bit. Um, but the idea here, again, uh, in the testing, this is kind of pre-deployment, right? And maybe some of those end-to-end -end tests could be what they call smoke tests. So that's after you launch, you'll make sure everything's working in production. This is now your, your code is out in the wild. How do you know it's performing as it should? You need to be logging, um, log enough to be useful. In payments, you're usually dealing with sensitive data. So you know, it, it might be uh, tempting to just, for debugging purposes, dump a bunch of like, entire objects to log so you can see what happened. Um, but if you're, you might end up <laughs> dumping PII to logs and, and shipping that off somewhere. Like that's, so that's not good. It needs to be useful, though. So <laughs> try and use IDs. That's, that's the thing there. Don't log entire objects. Use IDs. Uh, but it needs to be useful. 
understand your key metrics. So this could be very simple, right? So you're in payments, so you mentioned chargeback rates. You probably want something a little bit earlier than that, but whatever it is, right? So let's just say successful transactions and unsuccessful transactions. You just have something queryable that you can log, and then you can build dashboards from that. So then you have success rate, for example. So the you know uh, successful transactions over all transactions, for example. And so you, that ratio is something you want to track. And if that goes askew, something probably broke. If you have like a hundred percent auth rate, that's probably bad. If it's below 95, that's probably bad. Uh, volume going up and down is also something. This is, there's no perfect uh, way to do this. It's going to be you're going to be constantly dealing with uh, the balance of noisy alerts versus not enough alerts. Um, I could tell you though, like. 99% of postmortems, right? So when we inevitably fail as humans <laughs> and something breaks in production, you can almost always point to, hey, we should have had a test here, or hey, we should have a log here. That's almost always uh, one of the action items. Uh, there are plenty of paid uh, systems out there uh, that you could see on the exhibit hall, but there's also some nice open source um, free solutions. So Elk Stack is a popular one. So Log Stash is collecting the logs and sending them into Elasticsearch. Kibana is the, the UI. Uh, Grafana, um, Grafana and Prometheus, but Grafana's actually got their own full stack now. But the idea is you need something to aggregate the logs, put them somewhere to be queried, and then you need something to provide beautiful dashboards. And that's, that's it. I went through that a little quick, but we got time for Q&A. Thank you. Uh, it seems like there's different perspectives on this payment engineering idea, depending on where you stand in the chain, right? You could mm -hmm. be the person who's um, originating it, mm -hmm. I mean, not the, not, the, uh, per, not the customer, but the, the person right behind the customer, the merchant, say. Or you could be in the middle as the processor, or you could be one of the banks, or you could be the merchant all the way at the end, I guess, which is kind of like the customer, so they don't care. Yeah. But how does it? How does payment engineering differ at those intermediate levels, where you you may just have one, you may just be looking at one side, submitting the transaction, receiving it, or you may be actually sending it through? Yeah, I would say there's probably not a a, a hard rule on what's what is or isn't payments engineering. So that's why there's just kind of this rubric here of like, if you have to deal with all of these things, it's, you, you probably, there's probably some need for specialization, right? So where does this come in? Like say you have a, a company that is, I don't know, it's a, a SaaS platform or something and their product is monitoring, right? Their product is monitoring, uh, but they need to charge their customers. So payments is part of the problem, but uh, it's not really like, is it an undifferentiated problem? Probably not. Do you need to hire people that need to worry about all these things, or you just need somebody to like wire up Stripe? It kind of probably depends on the, the particulars of the business. But once you need to start worrying about these things, then I'd call it payments engineering. And in crowdfunding, you're in the middle <laughs> of many customers to many merchants, and so this is definitely a thing. Uh, but like, it's not as intense as um, you know uh, working at. Uh, Stripe in dealing with like raw card networks and whatever their ancient APIs are, right? So like Stripe provides us item potency keys. They provide value there. Uh, the card networks do not provide <laughs> such things to Stripe, right? So that's a different set of problems. So <clears throat> around your understanding your metrics, one of the things that often causes us false alarms is bot activity. Um, and so I'm mm. curious uh, what your perspectives are on bot activity. Bot activity, yeah. So yeah, that's one of the things that could definitely throw off your metrics. I would say use things like reCAPTCHA liberally. Um, it's, it's not foolproof, right? So reCAPTCHA is meant to catch bot traffic and it does that by requiring a little bit of a handshake to generate a token and then you validate that token. A, you know, a bad implementation would ask you to identify stop signs, for example, but there's a lot of um, you know, invisible recaptchas and not just Google's implementation. So I would say step one, make sure you have like any funnels, have some kind of 
uh, recapture on the back end, that'll filter out a lot. Um, but if it's at the point where they're like actually getting through transactions and maybe they've hired a farm to solve CAPTCHA, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a different level of fraud, so I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 it's probably not at the point of transaction, but uh, like the top of the funnel, for example, right? So if you're measuring f metrics from, let's say, cart, like viewing the cart to checkout, right? And that's one of your metrics. And if that goes down, probably something's broken, right? But maybe there's a URL out there in the wild that's got like the cart in it. And so now you've got I don't know, Facebook's crawling your site or something. It might not even be malicious, and uh, something that's supposed to be mid-funnel is now top of the funnel, and that'll throw off all your metrics. Uh, so yeah, no, no like, um, quick fix there other than um, you got to kind of filter this stuff out. Um, hello? OK. It's closer? OK. Um, in terms of immunability, um, with the process of going through like a payment or whatever, um, can anything be transactional where it can roll back if there's a failure or does that like violate immunability? And if so, what sort of design pattern solution is there around it? Oh yeah, good question. So immutability and transactions, right? So transactions uh, usually do that in your application if you want to run multiple database queries and you want them to be atomic, meaning inseparable. Uh, that's a good question. I don't have a, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule other than I think you would want to uh, record the facts. That's, that's what I would fall back to is record the facts. So if a bunch of stuff happened and un, un, it got unwound, I'd probably want to know that a bunch of stuff happened and it got unwound. So that might mean, you know, soft deletes, for example. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you'll end up getting a triage ticket or something and, like, what the heck happened? And if there was, like, transaction rolled back, deleted a bunch of records, you have no idea. So, yeah. Any other questions? How big is fraud problem? In terms of all the transactions, how many, how many of them are fraud? Um, you mean like industry-wide or? Yeah, how big is fraud? Um, I don't know. It's pretty big. It's pretty big. I don't know if I can go by volume of transactions because I've only been exposed to certain Banking industries. Transactions. Pardon? Banking and credit card transactions. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. Um, it's a real problem, though, right? So if you're running, if you're, <laughs> I work in crowdfunding, right? And so many payments to many merchants, you'll you'll see a bit of it. Um, there's different types of fraud, though, right? There's transaction fraud, meaning there's fraud at the transaction level, the the that first part of the payment, like stolen credit cards, for example. Yeah, that's a good question. So, the motivation. The motivation. Of, I'm here. The motivation of the question uh, is that banks are. The Fed is reevaluating financial policy due to three major factors, and it turns out that the money in the bank. If I if I, if I put a thousand dollars in the bank. It's not mine anymore. It belongs to the bank, and they're kind of keeping track of it for me. Mm -hmm. But the other thing they do is they keep track of profits for their investors. And so if a bank goes bankrupt due to losses, then, uh, then they, have to, they have to pay off the creditors. Well, I, as a $1,000 depositor, am a, have a, I, have, I, I have a claim on my $1,000. But the investors in the bank, the stockholders of the bank, they have the first claim, so they get paid entirely back, and then if there's any money for my $1,000, then I get paid back. Well, this is a threat to the consumers of America, and the, and the banks are running along, and they're all making money. Occasionally, they get, they get taken down because the Fed does some things, and then 
they get the banks taken down. Signature Bank took, got taken down. Uh, a bunch of them get taken down. So that's the question. Uh, it's really a threat on uh, against all the consumers who have money in the bank. And I think this is a, a, a abusive threat to, to the citizenry, and we should get active about it. So how big is the problem? That's my question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So that uh, is a little outside my expertise, but that is very interesting. I would say something I can answer is like, online transactions, uh, payments is a highly regulated industry. And so uh, this gentleman mentioned chargeback rates. So if you're facilitating transactions, chargeback rates are a, a little bit of a lagging indicator of fraudulent transactions, right? It's saying we've identified this as fraudulent, we've reversed it, and that can happen months later. But if that rate crosses a certain, certain threshold, you'll be shut down, right? Because uh, it's a highly regulated industry. So if you're facilitating payments that go past, and it's, it's less than 1%, it's measured in basis points. If you cross a certain threshold of basis points, you'll no longer be allowed to facilitate transactions. So it's a problem, but it's also a highly regulated industry uh, to prevent any kind of widespread abuse. Uh, by the way, this was excellent. Thank you so much for this info. Oh, thank you. Uh, so one of the questions I had was sort of continuing down the chargeback and fraudulent uh, transaction um, chain is, uh, are, are you more protected if you were to use platforms like Stripe from something like this? Like, are you protected better from fraud if you were to use platforms like Stripe? Yeah, that's a good question. It really depends on the uh, the setup you have. Right, so the, if you set up with Stripe, you'll probably be better protected than working with something closer to the metal. This is like a pure acquirer, um, but it's going to depend on the the setup you have, right? So for the most, like, let me let me try and think of an example. Um, the further you are out from the actual payments, the more fees you're going to pay, but the more protection you'll have, right? So if, I think Shopify, I think. I think they will absorb chargebacks because they're providing the whole platform. Uh, if you're just integrating with Stripe, like most agreements, you're still going to be liable for chargebacks, but they're going to give you tools, right? So there's something like Stripe Radar, right? And if you instrument all the stuff for Stripe Radar, it's going to go through their automated tools. Um, but yeah, if you're a platform connected to Stripe, um, you're going to absorb some of that risk still. I don't know, did I answer your question? The answer is it depends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, just kind of a follow up on that is you know I I have a company that I'm building out um, you know uh, Stripe payments for and things like that. So I'm kind of always nervous about money changing hands and things like that. That that was sort of the motivator of the question. Just to follow up on that was are there resources that I could use? I mean not outside of the Stripe documentation of course. Mm -hmm. uh, are there resources I can use to sort of understand more in depth of what you're what you've just kind of shown? That's my question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can put together some resources. I got cards we can talk. Um, I would say one, um, just to get an understanding of payments in general, I could recommend the book Payment Systems in the U.S. by Glenbrook. Um, if you're worried about fraud in general, Stripe does offer some really good tools. Um, and if your platform is like onboarding merchants, right, that's where things get interesting when you have to worry about both sides of the equation. Uh, and then you want to look at like KYC providers um, that can like make sure the merchant is who they say they are, things like that. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's a kind of processor agnostic fraud tools you could look into. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to chat afterwards. Yeah. Uh, uh, my question is based on remittances. So you just mentioned that there's a uh, automatic cutoff in case there is some chargeback of one plus or a limit, something like that. But what, I mean, those may be regulated within US, but what about international remittances? I mean, there is no international governing body on all those things. So wondering how does that come into play when in case we are transferring, and as for us, GoFundMe, will it accept payments or remittances from anywhere in the world or yeah. limited to certain locations. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I caught 
all that I'll, um, it had to do with global payments, right? So this was a little bit focused on payment systems in the US. The card networks are global for what it's worth. I don't, I'm not sure how that authority works, um, but you know, uh, Visa, Amex, MasterCard, they are global and they do have the authority to say like, to, to do things like chargebacks, right? So credit cards are global. They're not necessarily the most common payments other markets. So for example, in Germany, um, credit cards are used online, but less uh, common actually than using their bank account. <laughs> um, so in different markets, you're gonna have different patterns and distributions of payment systems. Credit cards are pretty global, uh, but let's say we're using something uh, specific to a market. Maybe it's a local bank transfer or um, what we call a local payment method, right? So in Europe, there's things like GiroPay. Um, you know, I use credit cards in, as, a, as an example. They all have kind of similar states, right? Um, some, I would say, it's an exception in some that you have like no reversibility, but most of them are gonna kind of follow a certain uh, formula of like an authorization and then actually getting the money and then some way to dispute a transaction. Um, so uh, it is true that it is not uh, this same model everywhere, um, but most even local payment methods in you know, different countries are gonna have some remit. There are exceptions though. Um, oh, my, sorry. My, sorry, Mike, over here. my question, uh, uh, what's your opinion about with, well, with the current uh, currency uh, market um, and the world's economy, how do you view uh, perhaps using uh, a more non-relational uh, database system compared to a more optimized ERP uh, system that's no longer in use? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so uh, for example, in today's uh, world economy where, you know, there's uh, more and more currencies uh, mm. growing and uh, by maybe the next uh, 50 years, you know, it's, it, we won't really know what the currency market is going to be like. Uh, my, my question is, using an old uh, hierarchical, hierarchical uh, system like the ERP developed by EdCode uh, that's being optimized in certain parts of the world, for example, compared to, you know, using AWS or uh, SAP HANA or Hadoop or any kind of new optimized system, what, is, uh, what would you say is better in, in terms of uh, practical uses, applied uses, uh, in terms of uh, financial uses, et cetera? Yeah, got it. Um, I, that might be a little bit outside of my expertise, but I would say it depends on what your company is responsible for. So if it's, you know, facilitating payments to merchants in a few different countries, that's probably not a problem you need to solve. Uh, but if maybe you're a global payment processor, that it's a problem you need to worry about. Uh, I, I have found some, like, like with cryptocurrencies and stuff, you know, you usually want to transact in minor units. So for USD, that means pennies. That's, you know, just a couple extra um, uh, bits. But, you know, if you're, there's bigger currencies with Satoshis, I don't know what the, denominator is there, but it's quite large, right? So if you're, you're dealing with um, data of a certain size, like these older ERP systems might not work. Uh, so I don't know if I have a good answer for you other than uh, I would balance the kind of rolling your own with, um, you know, sticking to the core competencies of whatever your, your business is responsible of, for. Thank you. Uh, thinking a little bit about this uh, immutability concept mm -hmm. made me think of, if you're standing in the middle of this chain, uh, so you're not the uh, uh, issuing bank, you're not the acquiring bank, but mm -hmm. you're in the middle of this thing, mm -hmm. and a transaction comes in from, from every perspective, is it synchronous on both sides? So 
a, a request to make a payment comes in and it goes to goes out the other side or is it sometimes sent later in other words the actual funds being sent out happens at a much different time than the funds coming in yeah good question so it was like uh question was about uh, kind of sync, async in this flow. Um, if we just look at the, this guy, um, so one example here, <clears throat> you know, like where you can kind of languish in the authorized phase, for example, like a uh, offline terminal, right? So maybe there's not, like, things are generally connected, you know, it's pretty ubiquitous now to have things connected to the internet, but sometimes they're not. So you might have a, a card terminal, that's smart enough to like capture some card data um, and you know talk to the EMV chip or something, but it can't actually tell the card network, hey, we have this card and we want to capture it. Uh, so that might happen later. But this is generally uh, asynchronous, I would say, moving between these states. Uh, so you got to worry about uh, hearing back. The the only exception is maybe authorized to capture in an online transaction. You could get kind of an instant re instant response. Probably that's, you know, someone like Stripe being nice and buffering the fact that like not all card networks actually ha are synchronous. They're just kind of taking it on themselves to say, yeah, okay, it was captured, but they don't really know for sure yet. I don't know if that answers your question though. So just yeah, now you refreshed my my uh, my terminology a little bit. No, I'm really talking about between the captured state and the settled state. Yeah, where you. You, you, you know you have a transaction, yeah. right? But let's just say, for example, that the, the settling guy's communications is down, right? Yeah. You can't talk to him, but you got a real transaction. Yep. So you have, to, you have to have an audit trail between those two, and that <laughs> needs to be immutable, right, in some way. Yeah, so it depends where you sit, right? So exactly, that's a very good point. So fr from capture to settle is a little bit no man's land. That's like we, <laughs> the money is in transit and most of us don't have visibility on that. I'm not even sure if, you know, uh, Stripe has visibility in that. That's like, goes to kind of a clearinghouse situation. And yeah, this, like, uh, this is one of the things you might monitor, right? It's like, what, what's the delay between capture and settle? Uh, for the major cards, Visa, MasterCard, it's T plus one. It's usually in a day. Amex can take a very long time. But that's one thing you might notice is like, hey, we have a bunch of captured transactions and they haven't settled in days. Like, well, what's going on here? Do uh, bank transfers from one individual, just like myself, my, my account to a different bank of myself, do they all follow the same flow? Um, kind of. So this is particular to credit cards. I wouldn't want to like over adapt to how credit cards work, but it's a similar situation, right? Where you kind of have to go through these different states and there's generally this no man's land that's the clearing house that sits between the two uh, that we don't always have very good visibility on. I have a question. For different POSs, do uh -huh. they, if they're all processing credit cards, they just go through that same function or do they process it differently? No, yeah, a point of sale system is gonna go through the same thing. So like next time you, um, you know, uh, tap or swipe your card, look at the terminal and you'll often see, that will say like authorizing, right? And then it'll say captured at the end. Uh, so you can actually see this happen. Uh, most terminals will kind of tell you what's going on there. I just had a quick question about the, the actual structure of the market participants from whenever an, a payment is initiated into where it's settled. Is there a, sorry, is there a, is there a book or something that charts out who all those intermediaries are that you might interact with? Yeah, payment systems in the US, it's the only payments book I know of, and it's pretty good. I recommend it, yeah. Thank you. They go into detail, and they go into detail about how payment systems make money and how checking works, and you'll be like, oh, so like fun fact, um, paper checks, right? Up until 2004, had to physically move paper for the money to settle. So, you know, you go through some, some chain like this, and like they'd literally have stacks of paper traveling the globe to settle real checks. It wasn't until 2004 that they accepted digital copies of checks to, to settle transactions. So yeah, payment systems in the US. I'll, I'll, um, if you go to, I'll, I'll post notes on my 
very high-tech blog. If you go to vincentsloan.com, it's got book recommendations. Uh, great talk. I love the state machine. Oh, thank you. The, for the, this seems like very specific to credit cards. I was wondering yeah. if you could speak to any gotchas if you're processing, say, like a debit transaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I tried to use the credit cards just as an example of like, there's enough state for this to be interesting. I don't over adapt to it, but it's all going to be pretty similar. So debit transactions, I think, are actually going to go through a very similar phase because they're usually processed on similar rails. Uh, difference is one, there's no actual credit, right? So in a credit card, the, you know, the, the issuing bank is, is basically loaning you money. On a debit card, it's taking your money. Uh, and for that reason, going from authorized to settled usually happens in minutes rather than days. Uh, but it does kind of pass through the, the same stages just very quickly. How does content-based fraud, like I would think that mm. you guys would be great to launder some money through, yeah. how, how does that affect this entire model and um, I guess, I mean, do you have any lessons that you've learned on that? I mean, I'm imagining you guys have a huge content fraud detection team <laughs> to, to go, hey, this looks like, you know, money muling or money laundering and how does, you know, kind of that, the, the level deeper of fraud as opposed to transactional fraud? Yes, good question. Uh, so <laughs> if you are facilitating payments, you have to worry th about things like AML policies, anti-money laundering. So it's not good enough that you say like, oh, okay, this is not a stolen credit card or whatever. It's also if you are responsible for the other end. Um, you know, if you're selling widgets, you probably have to worry about less, but maybe if the person selling the widgets is fun, you know, the widgets are drugs, for example, <laughs> that might be what you're referring to. So there's certain things that, you know, break the law. Uh, and folks can be subtle about um, uh, describing what they're selling, right? So there's, there's uh, no quick answer there other than, you know, if you are between those two things, you need really good, smart teams and layers of policies and tools to, to prevent that. Again, highly regulated industry, so um, maybe, you know, Maybe some folks can fly under the radar, but generally, uh, if you are in this kind of situation, you've got regulators making sure that you have these policies and tools in place. But I'm happy to talk after about ha such tools. Let, let, let's say I set up a GoFundMe for health services, <laughs> but I actually use it for something else. And like, what about the people who funded it? Can they come back and say, or I don't know, how does GoFundMe handle situations like that? Okay, we're, get, we're getting into uh, uh, employer-specific stuff. Um, so I'll just say what you can see publicly, which is the GoFundMe guarantee, uh, which is if uh, you know, the money doesn't go to where you think it should be going, you refund the money. Right, so GoFundMe will take that loss. Any other questions? All right, thanks for...